All right, welcome to the St. Louis Endgame Lecture. And we're here uh, both with a live audience and live online. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit, but before I do, let me just introduce this position. Uh, it's white to move. And I just wanna get your sense of what you think uh, white should play. And to me, I'm gonna make it easy. Um, I'm gonna say there's, even though there's actually loads of different things that white can do, what I'd like to uh, pretend is that there's only two moves, okay? So we're gonna pretend that bishop c3 is a move and that queen e1 is a move. So think about it just for a second. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I intend for the lecture, but as I'm talking, you can reflect on this decision about bishop c3 or queen e1. So uh, basically the idea I had for this lecture came to me as a kind of epiphany that's been building for a long time. It's something I've noticed in the chess world and um, it came from two elements that I want to talk about. First, the realization I have from teaching a lot of different players at different uh, skill levels is that some people don't reach the end game that much. And so sometimes with these students, I don't even feel like they should necessarily focus too much on the end game just because they're not even reaching the end game that often. Um, and it's a kind of interesting question, well, why isn't why aren't they reaching the end game? You know, and there's a certain kind of player who uh, doesn't get to the end game. Um, the next thing I want to say that's similar is the players who don't get to the end game very often. They are usually kind of dynamic players, willing to sacrifice, willing to stir things up, wanting to stir things up quickly. And so what I've noticed is that those players the end games that they do get are nuts. They're very imbalanced endings and they don't necessarily often feel like a normal position because everything's flying everywhere with wild imbalances. And I noticed that especially uh, studying with my friend GM Josh Riddell, before he turned positional, he was a crazy man and his end games were always pretty weird. All right, so now let's return to this position. And the way I'm gonna frame it is there's really two ends of the spectrum, right? There's more than two kinds of players, but the two ends in terms of how we think about the end games is I think there's the people who want to burn things down and there's people who want to build, right? The burners are the people who are sacrificing and are taking risks and they are going for it. And the people who want to build want to play with very small advantages. Okay, let me throw it out to the audience and then maybe people online can uh, say something as well. If you had to choose between only two moves, queen e1 and bishop c3, what would you do? Any thoughts? Bishop c3 uh, really is gonna get a totally different flavor of game than queen e1. Uh, it could go maybe something like this. Bishop c3 takes, takes, and rook d7. And maybe even, let's just put in the move e3 for white. White's position is incredibly solid, and black is going to be pinned down for a long time because it's very difficult to prevent these uh, the pawns here on b7 and c6 from being touched by the bishop. And white is playing with basically no, uh, no danger in his position. So if we go back um, and ask ourselves, what about queen e1? Uh, queen e1 is an entirely different flavor of game. With queen e1, white will keep the queens on and he intends to play e4. And the thing about e4 that you need to understand is then the point d4 becomes a potential weakness. And black can build on it, as happened in the game, uh, in this particular game. Now, to put names on it, this was reached with, uh, I think it was game nine, in the 1960 World Championship match. Game 11. Game 11. Thank you. I always get that mixed up between Tall and Botvinnik, and uh, 
in this position, but Vinick played queen c7, was playing for the end game almost every game in this match. And of course, tall is a burner and gets queen e1, right? Bishop c3, totally valid as well. So it's an interesting, what I'm gonna call a litmus test to how you answered the question is a good indication of what kind of player you are. And so um, the end games that then Tall got, and a lot of other players who are burners, very imbalanced. Even sa queen sacrifices in the end game, exchange sacrifices in the end game. Uh, very few what they would think of as piddly end games. End games where people are playing for small stuff. Now, to give you a sense of what I mean by building end games, um, I'm going to show just a couple positions. So, this first one comes from the King's Indian. And this is a variation I played uh, several times myself. You take on e5, and you play bishop g5. And this is going to be a long game, and you are playing really to <coughs> edge out black's pieces. Black is totally fine. I think the best move here is c6. But in any case, <coughs> we're playing for an end game. White is, for example, after, say, rook e8, castles where we're just trying to say our pieces are better placed than black's pieces so that's an example of a building ending and i just want to show a couple more here's another position this position smyslav had several times and we get this trade and to many people at first glance they assume that this position is equal and the fact that Smyslov won it twice against very strong opposition suggests otherwise. And it's interesting because uh, what we're talking about is a very small imbalance, which is really that our knight on d4 is stronger than the knight on b8. That's all it is. So again, an another good example of a building ending. And we're just trying to keep these, this small advantage of our knight being more active than our opponent's knight. Let's do another one. This comes out of the Queen's Gambit declined. I've done this as well. And you take. And there are several different ways this can go, but just imagine something like this. And again, White has some very small advantages, namely that his rook is better placed than his opponent. Um, and <clears throat> the whole game from here is going to be to try to make small uh, improvements to our position and trying to make one or more of our opponent's pieces bad. So another really good example. Uh, okay. One more. Of just, I just thought I'd do a little catalog of boring openings that I've played and are kind of famous. This comes out of when you play like an English and black insists on playing a Grunfeld, you can get this ending. <clears throat> and again, white is going to say this time that his king is going to be better on a square like c2. And the bishop on f8 is not going to really be happy on g7 because it's hitting a rock on c3. <clears throat> so again, this is again a really good example of the building position. I'm just trying to eke out a little bit of juice from the position to make the opponent suffer. Okay, now let's consider um, what an endgame looks like when it's more dynamic and a little bit more violent. One example from my personal experience is, you know, I was talking about my friend GM Josh Fidel and we studied a lot together and he would always in his actual games and in the analysis that we do head down the, these really obscure roads with uh, fantastic imbalances in the position. <clears throat> and so upstairs, one of the US championships I, was, I played, I played Joel Benjamin, who I think is a better player than me, but I, I thought I needed to play like Fidel. I needed to get a very imbalanced position if I was going to win. And so I played e4 without really even preparing. I just knew the kind of game I wanted. 
And I don't want to cover the game in too much detail, but I just want to show you we have incredible violence here. Uh, we have incredible violence here. Everything's hanging on the board. And uh, I think at this point I have a very nice position. But as often happens in these situations, you're gonna, what you're going to collect is you're going to collect something like the exchange. And black might have, as in this case, some powerful center pawns. And so here is a totally different kind of ending. And it's the kind of ending that you're going to reach if you play vicious attacking chess. And sometimes, of course, it's not going to go your way. It's not, of course, always going to go your way. And um, you're going to get something like this, which is you know, wildly imbalanced uh, materially, if nothing else. And of course, my king is poor. All right, so I thought there was a lot of different end games that I could take a look at to, uh, in particular. But I wanted to look at a particular ending and a particular player. I wanted to look at the Benko, first of all. And uh, I thought it'd be fun to look at one of my old my friends, John Fedorowicz, who was back when his game was played, one of the top US players. And he was playing the Benko all the time. Now, one of the funny things about the Benko, first of all, is it's really like a sister opening to the Benoni. Because in the Benoni, you uh, also have less space than white. And um, you have to try to trade because you have less space. And you are trying to get some drama on the queen side before you get murdered in the center and in your king. So th this Benko, first of all, the Benko opening, naturally wants to go to an ending because in the ending, the space advantage that white has in the center won't be as keenly felt. And the interesting thing, though, about Fedorowicz is when I looked at his games, there was so much violence, you know, especially at this time of his career, that there weren't that many actual straight up endings. Right? So this is what I m mean to say at the beginning of the show. The people who are on the far end of the burner spectrum, burning spectrum, they want to burn stuff down, they will, there's two things about their end games that they're going to get. They're going to be fewer. They're just going to get fewer endings. They don't, they're just going to steer away from them. And I think what's going to be critical to the development of every player is I think it's fine to play that way. And it's a beautiful, inspiring way to play. But the trick about it is when you is to say, well, I want to burn things down, but I don't want the end game to be such a hole, such a, you know, lack in my game that I'm afraid of reaching it. Right? So I think that's one of the key questions for these people is they don't actually get that many practical games to play the end game in. So they're often very inexperienced and don't feel the need. Okay, so that's the first thing I said, of course, about the burners. And then, of course, the second thing is that their end games will be weird, kind of like we're going to see here. Um, one thing we'll say clearly about the builders is the builders, um, you know, let's call them the boring people. Um, they obviously need to develop a huge skill set when it comes to endgame play. And oftentimes with those slow building positions, you, it's, there's an intuitive element to it, but you really also need to count. And what I mean by that is not just count like pawn moves and calculate, but really like see everything that your opponent can do because it's really all about containing your opponent when you play that way. All right. So uh, let's take a look at this. This position is uh, totally interesting even today. And um, let's say that the virtue of what White's done is he's, at least at this point, refused to trade anything, right? By going to g2, the bishop's kind of funny on g2, but at least uh, there's no imminent trade happening now for black, which is what he wants. Now let's talk briefly about the, the idea of the, the, the Benko, 
which is really like we're putting pressure on the A and B really mostly to distract white from crushing us in the center. And that honestly was something it took me forever to understand. And if you play the Benko, it's a huge advantage uh, if you understand that and have some experience because your opponents will think that their advantage consists in the A pawn. That's simply not the case. Their, their advantage consists in the space advantage uh, in the center. And at the moment, the A pawn doesn't mean that much. Why h3? To stop knight g4 and knight e5 trading stuff off. All right, very standard stuff. e4, knight e8, knight e5. And here, already maybe the beginning of some bad signs that black, uh, that, yeah, that black gets this trade. Bishop g7 is a nice move. He didn't have to do it, but he is holding on to the pin on c3. And this is very simple uh, Benko stuff at this point. We're moving in on the queen side, making grief for black, for white. And e5 is a clever move. Um, uh, if white takes it, then the pawn on c5 will be weak. And r r let's say right from this point, we're going to start to get uh, kind of, let's call it the madness in the position. Bishop c8. And one nice thing about this move is the fact that white has ghosted us uh, with the bishop. And what I mean by that is just that the bishop on a6 didn't touch anything. Now the bishop is going to come back the other way. So I don't want to spend too much time with this. I want to get to the end game part. And we get this whole position. c4, knight d6, queen d2, good move. All right, so here we have the end game. And it's a really interesting position. Uh, the first, a lot of people I think on first glance might think that white is better because he has an outside pass pawn. Um, now, one thing I often say that gets me in trouble, and I hope the St. Louis Club doesn't feel that, that I'm talking loosely here, is I say pawns aren't people. And what I mean by that is simply, they're, you know, they don't affect the game in the same way the placement and activity of the pieces do. So the pawn on a2, really, without any kind of support, and this happens all the time in the Benko, without any kind of support, it's really just, uh, just a guy left out on a limb over there. There's not much to do to help it. Now, it's weird to think that black would have the advantage here, honestly, because... Uh, you know, it just seems uh, that there's nothing much, right? Doesn't seem like there's that much going on. Well, let's take a look. Bishop f1, we trade some stuff, and then we play f5. Now, of course, a lot of these moves from both sides could be debated, uh, but this is a very practical kind of position. And let's look at the way this went. So takes, takes. And the first thing we should say is uh, we have a really interesting imbalance here that's going on. It's definitely in black's favor. And that is that when you get to the end game, um, there is a, a huge advantage to having connected pawns, especially pawns that can become connected passers. And um, one way to talk about this is to say, you know, in all phases of the game, there's really three dimensions to chess, right? You have a material dimension, which is just who has more stuff. And you have a time dimension, who has more tempi. And then you have this third thing, which is harder to understand, which is the quality of position. And I think one of the reasons end games are tough is it's hard to understand what that, what that quality of position means in an end game. Um, and we can talk about king uh, activity and peace activity, of course. But then, like this game, if you have some connected past pawns, uh, not only will they maybe be reaching for uh, to become a queen, but as we'll see in this game, there's also uh, they can also work to uh, actually create mating nets against the white king. Um, something I find again and again teaching is that 
often I feel people don't um, appreciate how much the attack for mate in the end game uh, is, is at stake. I feel like people are just thinking about pawns and material and getting their pawns to the other side of the board. But the attack on the king is very much a real thing. Okay, rook c6, bishop f8. It seems right that nothing um, incredible has gone wrong here. Rook d2, and black plays f4, and bishop b6. Here's actually a funny point um, where when we talk about playing this kind of endgame well, there is a vast literature that I very much enjoy of chess problems, of chess endgame problems. And um, I don't know quite why I enjoy them more. Maybe because it's, they're cleaner and they're, you can really do some nice calculations and have some nice ideas in the endgame studies. In any case, if you're going to be one of the people who likes to burn down the houses, Studying those kinds of studies, I think, is really what, you, what, what would really be helpful. And in fact, black plays a totally reasonable move here in f3. But he missed a great shot, which I think is to me like an uh, endgame study, which is rook a6, and it looks silly because you don't want to play rook takes c6 because you don't want to help this pawn uh, become stronger. Right? Well, the problem is, and by the way, the, this would work wherever the bishop went, whether it went to d8 as well, is rook takes d5. Really nice shot. We're hitting both rooks. And he, he can have one. He can have one of our rooks, but he can't have both. And uh, it's a major problem, not only because uh, we've won the pawn, but because we're worth looking at serious connected pass pawns here. Okay. So f3, and there's a simple mate threat, rook g1, b1. <clears throat> By the way, a good rule of thumb is that in the end game and in the middle game in the opening, uh, it's a pretty good idea to, in general, leave your pawns on the opposite color of your bishop. And the point is simply that your bishop, in this case, is controlling the dark squares and your pawns can control the light squares. So it's almost the same principle, I never even put it this way, but the same principle as having the two bishops, right? And the, the whole thing with the two bishops is the bishop is just a better piece than the knight because it controls more squares. But the downside is, of course, that it, the poor guy, only touches half the board. So if you put your pawns on the light squares, you can fight for the other half of the board that's not available to you. King g1, e4. And I can imagine white thinking that he was maybe okay here. But in fact, it's really problematic here. So bishop e3, check, king h2. And here, there's definitely more than one move. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we were in serious time pressure here. The move bishop g7 makes a lot of sense to me here. Uh, but okay, let's look at what Fed did. And I'm assuming it's just because this was played back in the day that they got more time at move 40. Rook c4. And the problem is if you don't win any of those pawns, it's kind of, uh, it's not going to work for you. Rook g1 is going to be coming. Um, notice, it's, I guess it's obvious at this point, but notice that the pawn on a2 really is just a spectator. The thing is going nowhere, and, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that black is the one who has the initiative here. White is trying to trade the rook on e8 so he doesn't get mated. Check, We're going after the pawn, and we get it. And, you know, one pawn is often not enough to win, but the problem in this position is really that Black continues to have the initiative. The pawns are all set to be going on light squares, and the pawn on f2 is fixed and can become a weakness. And let's just say it, the white king, even though we traded one pair of rooks, is still not out of danger here. So surprisingly to me, I, I think this position is, uh, if not lost, very close to lost. Let's look here. 
or a D4, A4. We're not really interested in the pawn, because pawns aren't people. And it's funny, you know, to a certain extent you'd say to yourself, well, wait a second, uh, wasn't that a good trade for white? Well, the bummer is, though, that we're going to come after that F2 pawn, and yeah, we're, we're, we'll see here. So rook c, rook c6, bishop g3, and it's actually already all over. King g1. Any ideas of what, what, what black should play? Actually, it's ridiculous. I was doing this the other day, too, and I, and I was, I think I was, I was giving a lecture and somebody, I, I asked a question like that and they, somebody shouted out, this is totally ridiculous. We can see what's going on on the notation board. You're asking a stupid question. Well, it's not the first time that I've done that. Yeah. Black's going down attraction, right? Black's going, black's going downtown here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So e3, and that's pretty much the end. Because you can't allow e2, you can't really allow ef either. And we have rook g2 coming. And that's in fact what happened. And notice now that there's no way to stop the f pawn from queening. Because we're going to check on a square like a1. And his checks don't really do anything. Black takes his time here, very admirable. There's nothing white can do. Now we check, and this is all over. I'll play a couple more moves, but basically, you know, you got the pawn, it's going to be winning pretty easily. He tried some dirty tricks there. We have to give him that. Yeah, check the miserable king, and he gives up. So, yeah, a really interesting game, and maybe just to recap uh, what I'm saying, and maybe uh, Ben has any questions from the audience, I can address those, um, the online audience. But the basic concept that I'm putting forward here that I think is kind of useful to categorize people is that there's a fundamental intuition in every chess player uh, that goes probably to their personality, or you know how 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 they grew up, or if they had some trauma in their childhood, we can you know theorize. But we know this from experience. Most players do that. They face both kind of players, and some people are in between, right? There's no strict division between people who want to build and people who want to burn stuff, right? But we definitely have all met the burners and played against them, and we've met and played the builders. So it's a nice spectrum. Uh, and the end games that they get are a nice indication of just how different the chess that they experience in their chess life is entirely different from the other people on the other side of the spectrum. It's a different skill set. And honestly, for me, it might be a point where you ask yourself, tell yourself, ask yourself as a player, like, well, what is it really that I'm good at? For example, I enjoy attacking, and I've won some nice attacking sacrificial games, but am I really that good at it? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. And so, you know, the fact, the interesting thing about it that I didn't really necessarily plan, because um, I wasn't aware of this distinction when I did it, but, you know, when a mediocre guy like me becomes a GM, it was, a lot of it had to do with choosing boring positions like this, and this, and this, and then, you know, painfully acquiring the skill set of playing endgames. Because this will all ultimately lead to very complicated uh, endgame positions. They, they all become very convoluted, but not, usually not materially imbalanced like the burners get. Of course, you can get a, an exchange exact later in this position. It's technically possible, but in general, in general, no, it's going to be more tame, even if it's going to be violent. For example, right upstairs, uh, last US Championship, Gureyev had this position against Fabi, though I believe it, act it was the, the other variation where black, it's very similar, but I believe it was like Fabi played this variation. In any case, a very similar position. Um, 
And uh, I thought Gareev got a great game. And then, you know, the other thing about playing like this is the games are longer when you're a builder. And that what happens with Gareev in that game was that he fell into time trouble. And Fabi is, of course, you know, an evil genius when it comes to endings and creating problems. Ben, what do we got? In the chat, Amir says, or he asks, do you have any book suggestions for this topic for 1,800 players? Mm. Uh, I think that uh, 1,800 players in particular uh, often fall into a trap where when they think of endings, they think of learning algorithms. For example, in the Dvoretsky Manual, which is a great book for what it is, it's really just teaching you endgame algorithms. Uh, you know, how to checkmate with a certain constellation or win with a certain constellation. Whereas in reality, what endgame play is, at least in practical play, I'm going to say in reality, is far before you get to the algorithms, you're going to get to positions like this where you're going to need to learn how to build uh, the small position, you know, build up the small advantages. And a great book that helped me was uh, Smyslov's Endgame Virtuoso, which is basically just a collection of his endings. Um, and playing through, you know, endgames by great players who talk a little bit about what's going on and the principles behind them, I think in general that's a good start for an 1800 player. Well, Ben, should we call it there? Or do we got another question? Chemistry Guy asks, just out of curiosity, to what extent do you think that the Karo Khan is a good opening? <laughs> a little off topic. A little bit off topic. Um, the Karo Khan, you know, it's gone, it's, it's having a hard time. Let's say that it's having a hard time. And let's go and we'll talk briefly about Karo Khan just because we have the question. Uh, what I do, one reason I want to answer the question is there are loads of great endings uh, in this kind of position. Uh, Kaspar, uh, Kasparov played black as this, honestly, and uh, Karpov played a lot of great games as white. A great end game I really like is, is Karpov versus Larson as a double rook ending. Comes out of this position. And that was uh, how the Karo Khan was played back in the day. And this position, I feel, if you could get this position all the time with the Karo Khan, then that would be great. The drama with the Karo Khan now really, I think, is all about this move. And when I was a kid, people thought that this was no bueno because the bishop got out and they said to themselves something like, well, we've got now a French where the bishop's out. And what White has shown over the last, I don't know, 20 years, and I think to my mind Short was the first guy to really push the case, is that actually c5 will be difficult to play because the light square weakness is on the queen side and the loosening, the opening of the d4 square. And if you don't play c5, you're going to have less space. So White can play for a nice space advantage in this position. And so to the answer to the question, I would say, if you like this position, then I think that's fine. But it is going to be against a good player anyways. This is going to be a good, uh, you're going to be tested. Now, this is a totally different subject, but it's also important, like endgames, to learn to play with both space and lack of space. And this is a perfect example of, of that kind of dynamic heading out of the opening. All right. Well, let's end it there. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to do this. We're going to do this next week, I think. And so if you have any questions or things you want me to cover, maybe a specific ending, you can uh, write to me on Twitter or you can write to the club's Twitter and uh, I'll try to cover it. All right. Thank you.